This week's episode, we answer a lot of questions, talking about the controversy from last week's episode on the Volkswagen GTI, and we answer your economical car choice questions next on Talking Cars. Hi there, and welcome to Talking Cars with Consumer Reports. I'm Tom Mutchler. I'm Gabe Shenhar. And I'm John Linkov. On last week's episode, Mike Quincy said a few things about the new Volkswagen GTI that might have pissed some people off. Let's take a quick look back at what Mike said. I think the GTI is thumbs down. It's not that big a deal. You take out the GTI steering wheel, the GTI badging, and put me in it, and I think, this is a redesigned Golf. There's nothing sporty about this car. Well, as you see, Mike is no longer with us. He's banned, kicked off the set, banished, at least until next week when Mike will probably be back. Anyway, you know, look, the GTI is a very popular, very important enthusiast car. We want to answer some of the questions that came up from it. First of all, uh, we got the question, is it any different from the Mark V and Mark VI, the previous two generations of the car? Consumer Reports praise that car for being sporty and fun. Every other review of the Mark VII seems to say it's gone in a more performance-oriented direction than previous generations. So where is CR's concern with the Mark V and Mark VI? Or are we getting bored with its competence? Well, truth to be, be told, uh, in relative terms, it's pretty similar to the Mark VI and Mark V. But the Mark VI was something a little more visceral about it. I mean, the exhaust sound, the immediacy of, uh, of every response. Uh, this, this Mark... Uh, Mark 7 is, uh, is more sedate, it's more grown up, it's a more mature kind of a car. But to call it boring is totally uh, blowing it out of proportion. Sure, I'm with you on that. John? Yeah, it's not boring, but it's not a head and shoulders move away from the Mark 6. Um, it feels a little bigger, it feels a little heavier. Um, I don't care for modes, just sport mode should be the standard mode and no other modes. It's a sports car, stop the normal and adjustables just well, I make th it sport. I, th I think that, uh, you know, the question gets to that it's going in more performance oriented direction. Yeah. I think it's marketing performance oriented. I think, I think it's it, release performance. It, 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 well, it might be. It's, 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 points, marketing it's, got, it's got more power, it's got a couple more electronic modes. Yeah, it's fun to drive. I ripped around back roads yesterday specifically because of this show to make sure I was familiar with it. And you know what, it was fun, but it didn't stir the soul. And it just feels like a bigger, it feels like a sedan, That's actually. This, your soul's like molasses. Like, yeah, it's my soul. My, it's black like my soul, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's actually, I, I, I like the last one better. I just like the last one. It felt more intimate, more cockpitty, more of a sports car. This one's just lost a bit. You can drive in sport mode all day long. And I think that's probably the default mode that they were aiming for. And there was probably some kind of an internal argument in the company. And They've had those. You know, yeah. There was a whole thing about <laughs> stability control, being able to turn it on and off on yeah. the Mark 6. And, and uh, they probably backed off a little bit and made the, the other mode the standard mode. And you know, one thing is the car should be developed not in the sense of, oh, well, everyone knows they're going to put suspension and a tune and they're going to airbag it and put its stance. You know what? All that's garbage. The car should come out and be sporty. It's still a great car. I would love to have one. I think it's one of the few in the, in the segment that, that's there and it stands head and shoulders above its, its, its peers still, but it's just not as exciting as the last generation. I think that's the thing that was missed a lot in, in the last show. Mike was very down on the car. That was his opinion. Uh, I think, that, you know, you said you'd be happy driving the car. I would be happy owning the car. In fact, I got the question. You mentioned that I would buy a GTI over an Audi A3 and he wanted me to explain why. I've got a ton of reasons why. First of all, I can get the GTI with a stick. I cannot get an A3 with a stick. I can get a loaded GTI for about 32 grand. That gets me an A3 with, with next to nothing. nothing. Um, you know, I'd rather have the hatchback on the GTI. Yep. Uh, that said, the A3 gets you the, three, the four rings on the hood. It gets you a longer warranty. I think it probably gets you some sort of scheduled maintenance. Uh, do they do scheduled no, maintenance or do Audi you gotta cut buy back it. on Audi, scheduled You got to buy it with Audi. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Unlike, you know, only unlike, BM, unlike BMW. BMW. You know, BMW right. gives you four years of, of maintenance. Yeah. You know, the, the A3, look, good for them to finally start separating their models. Sure. So you don't really have them butting up against each other. I would totally buy a GTI before that, but I would probably buy a used Mark VI. Well, to be clear, Mike's opinion is his, his opinion, and ultimately it's not going to affect how the car scores. No, we'll, we'll run it through all the tests. Right. It, it will get what we get. You know, also, I've got to say, uh, we, we got a letter that pretty much sums up how we feel about the car uh, from Jacob Frey. For CR, name one car as well-rounded as the GTI for the price. I don't think it has any competition when you consider its performance credentials along with the daily comfort and practicality. 
Yeah. 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 Uh, it's right on the money. I mean, the car is that that's the story that of the car. The, I mean, it's a it's a, co a compromised in some ways, but it's so well rounded. It does so many things well. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, moving on, another question about we're going back to the why we're in, talking about GTIs. A question about the Mark Six. This came from Andrew Price, who compared me to Chuck Norris in the YouTube comments, which both thrills and, and kind of scares me, to be honest with you. Too. But, but I'm not going to read that stuff. You can go back and look at it if you want. Anyway, here's his question. One of my friends owns a 2013 Golf GTI, and he loves how it drives. However, he's concerned about the car's reliability, so he's considered selling it in the next year in favor of something that will be less expensive to own and operate. He likes a 2015 V6 Mustang, but I warned about cars in their first year. Do you think this is an overreaction on his part? First thing, should he get rid of the GTI? Well, if he likes the car, then no. I mean, it's going to cost you some, some money down the road because it's uh, kind of expensive to maintain Audis and Volkswagens. But uh, that's, that's the trade-off. I mean, do you want a boring car that doesn't cost you anything? Or uh, it just depends on the individual. John? Yeah, I think, it, again, it, it's, it's putting the car before the horse. Getting a first-year model, like the gentleman said, is you know, fraught with problems. You know, because the first year is a teething year, let's be honest. So running out and buying a 2015 Mustang, he may be back at the dealer for, for little fixes more than he would be at the GTI for even regular maintenance. I would keep the GTI. I'd keep the, it's also the final year. Is it the, a 15 or a 14? It's a 13. So, 13. Anyway, so it's one of the final he's, years he's of the three previous years in the model. So they figure right. out how to run. build it. Yeah, by that it's, point, it's pretty yeah. solid. Yeah, you're, I, I you're, would be confident. You're going to have a better it. chance. I mean, if the car is being troublesome now, you know, and you don't feel confident with it, yeah, sure. If you really want a Mustang, yeah, sure. Look, it's going to be cheaper to keep the car you have than to trade it in, take the loss on depreciation, pay taxes again on the next car. Pay whatever deal or markup there is on early Mustangs, too. Yeah, there's the thing. That's something to consider. It also plays into our next question from Matt Patrick. I'm debating trading in my 2011 Ford Fiesta SES for a new 2014, which is the current, the outgoing car, Ford Mustang V6 Premium. With all the incentives, it's hard to resist the performance bargain. Should I snag a great deal on the 14 or wait for the 15 Mustang redesign? Oh, you're going to regret it so much if you get the 14 and then you see what the 15 is like. So I, uh, I would hold on to the Fiesta for a little more. Fiesta, place your order in 2015 and get a 16 Mustang once they've ironed out all the problems. You know, I, I'm actually, I'm, I'm going to go a little bit different. I think, you know, they're, they are making awesome deals on 2014 Mustangs. And the Mustang V6, the outgoing car, is a pretty mm -hmm. fun car to drive. There's something like $6,000 off. I think you could buy that car at discount, keep it two years, and sell it and not lose too much money. That lets, you, that lets them work out the problems with the new Mustang. That said, I think the new Mustang, look, everything Ford is doing from scratch nowadays, it's, it's, it, they're great driving cars. Mm -hmm. You know, <clears throat> stuff that isn't built on old Volvo platforms <laughs> for Ford. Yeah. You know. Great driving cars, but the infotainment system is problematic. Yeah, hopefully they'll eventually yep. fi yeah. fix my Ford Touch. I, I have a lot of, I, have a lot, I think there's a lot of promise in the new Mustang. I wouldn't run out and buy the first model year. Yeah, and I wouldn't do the, the, the purchase just because, like you said, taxes and registrations and this and that. You know, just save your money, put it away, put the poster up on the wall, put the screen, the desktop, you know, on, on, your, on your screen and, and buy that 16, in, in my opinion. Unless you really want to get out of that Fiesta really bad. Yeah, that's true. I mean, Fiestas yeah. aren't the most reliable cars, so who, who knows. Um, from Josh G, another, another person looking for fun for not too much money. I'm 24 on a tight budget of $18,000 and need something good. I currently drive a 2007 Dodge Caliper. First, a moment of silence for driving a Dodge Caliper. Yeah, you'd want to get out of that caliper. Yeah, get, 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 get out of that caliper. Yeah. Buy the Fiesta from the previous guy. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> My gut tells me to go Japanese, but how has Ford gotten in terms of reliability? Are they safe to buy, or should I just go with a Honda or Nissan? I really like the Fusion, but I don't want to buy yet another money pit. I mean, I guess 18 grand will probably buy you, it might buy you a Fusion, a new generation Fusion. It's probably like the one parked behind mm -hmm. us. It's probably going to be an ex rental fleet car. I don't know if I'd go with that. It's a great car. Reliability yeah. um, over the long run? I don't know. Why not go with a Mazda 3 or something like that? Ooh. Yep. I mean, it's a kind of a fun car to drive. It's going to be a reliable, likely, very, very headache-free kind of car. Yeah, I, I think if, you're, if you've got 18 grand, the best car to buy, that car parked right behind us, Mazda 3. You're not going to get that touring version. You're going to probably get a Sport. You might have to haggle a bit. Uh, I think by now you're getting 15, so you're into the next year of it. Mm -hmm. um, Left over. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you could get a leftover. Even then, it's going to be a late build car, yep. so you're not getting the very first one of that redesign. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what was cool about this question, what I appreciate, is that the YouTube community really kind of stepped in. We don't get to questions right away. The YouTube community stepped in, gave Josh a bunch of recommendations. Uh, from Fat Boy 19831. I wonder what Fat Boy 19830 hmm. is like. Um, William Howard Taft? I don't know. <laughs> could, could, be, could be Taft. Uh, the Mazda 3 is the best all around new car for under 18 grand. If you do your homework, you can even get one cheaper. Uh, also, had a response from Elton John, who is a fan of the podcast. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah I like, we appreciate I like your Daniel that. Song. I don't know if he's a tiny dancer or not, but. A rocket man. Pinball wizard. There you there go. You we'll stop now. 18,000 would easily buy a low mileage 2012 Fusion, the old style sport, with all wheel drive and a 3.5 liter V6 loaded. Uh, they're reliable, as is any Accord. I wouldn't get all wheel drive. Uh, but I do think the last generation Fusion Sport was a pretty nice yep. car. Yep. It was also very reliable because it was the last model year. They had worked out the bugs. That was a long running model too. That so. was a long yeah. running yeah. model. Yep. Uh, so yeah, that, that might be something to look for. Two very good choices. Two great choices. We, we thank the YouTube community for coming up with those. Uh, next question. If saving money is my top priority, shouldn't I buy a base model manual Corolla or a four-speed automatic or even the CVT instead of a normal Toyota Prius? Surely the Corolla will cost less to run in five years when compared to the Prius. Well, I don't know. How long is he going to uh, keep the car? I mean, for, uh, for the long run, there's nothing like uh, Prius in terms of owner's cost. No, th yeah. there, there just I mean, isn't. It's going to be half the money uh, on a daily basis with the Prius versus the Corolla. Yeah, you know, insurance, are you a good driver? You know, you're going to have repairs, you know, in the sense of body damage, stuff like that. That's not the same owner cost stuff we figure in, but certainly insurance. You know, if you have a bad record, it's going to be higher, pre you know, you're going to pay more in your For insurance. What? Just in the general, you know, oh. not comparing the two cars, but, you know, you're going to have a higher, so you're adding in costs there. Um, but Corolla or a Prius, what's going to be cheaper to run? I mean, l right. l l l let's do the math. A, a Corolla is going to cost you about $5,000 less up front. Uh, you know, I wouldn't get a stripped Corolla. Oh, good. Oh, don't good. do that. Don't, don't mean, do no, that. No, you're least, not going to be able to sell it. No, the resale on that right. is going to be awful. At least get, but, an, get an LE or get an S. The S is a pretty, uh, as far as Corollas yeah. go, the S is, yes. is, is a pretty nice car. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so there's going to be a $5,000 price difference. The Corolla is going to get, I think, 31 32, 32 miles MPG. Two. Overall yeah. versus yep. 44 with the Prius. That makes the Prius cheaper to run, but the Corolla is certainly not expensive. Right. Prius doesn't have inflated costs because of the hybrid system. You're not the dealer more. You're not, you know. No, and, you're not paying more to fix a Prius. No. A Prius and the batteries is, are lasting. We, we, we had the 200,000 mile Prius that was, you know, the, the battery was the original battery. Yeah. So that's not a concern. And you got the resale value. Um, I mean, I think you're. There's really no more rational car out there than the Prius. Uh, that said, I, I do think, yeah, I, I agree. I think your operating costs are going to be lower in a Prius. I don't think they're going to be astronomically lower because the Corolla is so fuel efficient to begin mm -hmm. with. And you're saving $5,000 up front. You will get the resale back out of the Prius in the back. End. You will. I don't think you'll do bad with a Corolla. You know, it's really up to you. Do you want to put the money in up front or do you want to pay a little tiny bit more in gas money? Mm -hmm. Or you can just get a Mazda 3, which is, is, is more fun than, than, uh, than either one of them. Uh, one last question. From the Airplane Master. I'd love to know what airplane is in his profile picture, by the way. So put that in your response. We live in the D.C. area and are taking a trip to Vermont. We have a 2004 Honda Odyssey and a 2010 Subaru Outback. I've been trying to convince my parents for us to take the Outback. It has better fuel economy, it's quieter, and it has enough room for our bags. My parents say the Odyssey is more comfortable and has more space. I say it's plastic and sounds like my ear is hanging one foot off the pavement. You might want to go to a doctor to get that fixed. Who is right? Who's right, John? I would take the Outback. The Outback is <clears throat> big, very roomy, holds a lot of stuff, far more comfortable, far quieter. The mileage is a, is a, is a great point. Um, and I don't know the condition of the Odyssey, but it's 10 years old, so it's not you know, going to be drum tight. Yeah. I would take the Outback. Well, the Odyssey is definitely roomier, but uh, <clears throat> the, the Outback is going to be more fuel efficient and, uh, and quieter. I mean, you know, look, let's, let's face it. Uh, I, if he's going with his parents, uh, the airplane master is going to be sitting in the back seat. Um, I'd rather sit in the back seat of an Odyssey. 
Mm. I'm going to have my own captain's chair. It's going to be gonna loud. It's going to be loud. They both have the same infotainment. I mean, an 04 <laughs> Odyssey and a 13 Outback. A 10 Outback. Yeah, yeah, 10 yeah, Outback they, so. yeah, they're pretty much the same with a high tech. Uh, It'll be comfortable, more comfortable for him, but if he is so, we're, you know, I would make a strong case for that Outback and on dollars alone, the fuel economy. Um, that said, though, it's ultimately going to be your parents' choice, and I, I, I hope you have a vote in this. <laughs> parents. Parents. I'm, I'm not super optimistic, but uh, it sounds like the Outback would be our choice. That's going to wrap it up for this episode. On the next episode, if everything goes according to plan, we're going to talk about the new Lexus NX. We'll see you then.